My name is Anthony Fatsies and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we interview finance, trading and investing experts to help you understand current market trends and learn about the intricacies of new and existing assets. If you enjoy the podcast and to help with the YouTube algorithm, please like, comment and subscribe. It really helps with the podcast and it means we can continue to get amazing guests. Thanks again. And I hope you enjoy. So, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of What the, the What the Finance Podcast. Uh, on today's episode, I'm happy to be talking with Christopher Leonard, a New York Times best-selling journalist and author of the recently released book, The Lords of Easy Money: How the Federal Reserve Broke the American Economy, which is available everywhere, and I definitely recommend buying it as well. So, uh, Chris, thanks for joining the podcast to talk with me today. And just on to my first question: What was your influence for writing the book? Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, you know, the influence for writing the book was really important to me. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a business reporter. I've been doing this for years. And, and this book kind of happened by accident uh, when I was interviewing a source on a different project. And to me, that's important because I think reporting and journalism has always got to come from the outside world in and from sources first, you know. And I just had the opportunity to meet this guy who talked to me on background. I'm not trying to be coy, but he wanted to be anonymous or whatever. But he was, he was one of these really brilliant financial market types. And he and I were talking in 2016. And this guy was really obsessed with and, and frankly worried about what was going on in asset markets. He was saying that asset prices were really inflated. And he spent hours walking me through how the Federal Reserve had been pumping up asset prices for years. And I thought when I left this interview, you know, this guy's got to be off base. What he's telling me seems exaggerated. Like, for example, he explained to me how the Fed had created 300 years worth of money in about four years. In other words, we're talking about the monetary base here or the sort of high powered money that the Fed can create out of thin air you know, in the first century of the Fed's existence, it, it expanded the monetary base to about a trillion dollars. And then between 08 and 2014, the Fed prints 3.5 trillion. I mean, that's a step change. And, and that money is created directly inside the reserve accounts of 24 institutions on Wall Street. You know, it's, it's pumped right into the banking system. And it, it created massive changes in our economy, pumping up asset prices in the stock markets and bond markets. And so that's how that's that's what got me obsessed with this. I I, I thought it, it wasn't talked about enough what's happened over the last decade. I know as a business reporter, I didn't understand it enough. So that's what got me down this road. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, you know, you mentioned the book. It's almost like people think it's like a necessary evil. It's like, okay, we had to do this to try and save the economy. But throughout the book, you sort of mention, and, and I guess we'll get to it later, how it didn't really have to be the case. That that's exactly right. I mean things really evolved the more I learned and the more I reported. I mean, at, at the beginning, you know, like all reporters in the business world, I, I idolize Michael Lewis, right? He's, he's just the best in the game. And I, I kind of wanted to write a money ball about quantitative easing, like a book that would just explain in clear English what had happened and how it worked. But it was over the course of reporting it that that my understanding really deepened. And, and I I came to see that this policy, it's not just that it wasn't necessary. And the key thing for us to remember here, I think, is that we had this time of crisis, 08, 09. And nobody argues that during a global financial crisis, the Federal Reserve ought to just sit on its hands. I mean, the Fed was built to be the lender of last resort. But the story I tell starts in 2010, when the economy was starting to slowly and unsatisfactorily grow out of the, out of the deep hole of the recession. But the economy is growing nonetheless. And that's when the Fed stepped in and changed its mission from being the lender of last resort to basically like the primary vehicle of economic growth. And that's when this program I talk about a lot called quantitative easing, which is that money pumping into Wall Street, that's when this really started. And so that's what this book is about, is the decade of the 2010s when the Fed took on really, you could say the most central role it's ever had in our economic growth. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's still there at the moment. So uh, the book starts, it's from a, the perspective of uh, Thomas Honig, uh, who, you know, I personally hadn't heard of, I'm not sure if many of my listeners may have heard of either. Uh, but can you maybe explain who he is and sort of why is he so important to this story? Yeah, that's, that's such a great, thank you for bringing that up. You know, I hadn't heard of this guy either. 
um, you know, after I became obsessed with quantitative easing in 2016, I started reporting on it. And one of the things that struck me was there really hadn't been a lot of in-depth reporting. There wasn't a book about quantitative easing. And, and in the reporting that did exist, what I saw in, immediately was that this most important vote that the book opens with in November of 2010, this is when the Fed votes to do a round of quantitative easing during a recovery that was really the beginning of this era of hyper easy money. And I saw the vote was 11 against one. And, and so, you know, as a reporter, you're thinking, huh, so the Fed committee that voted on this was 11 against one. Who's the one? Who voted against it? What, what's this guy's deal? Well, that person ended up being Thomas Honig, the president of the Federal Reserve in Kansas City. And Honig has kind of been remembered by history as this sort of super hawk or, or this cranky dissenter who always voted no and was just sort of stubbornly a, a no vote all the time. And that's what I thought about him and not much else. But when I started digging into the actual historical record, I realized that that view is really wrong. And the story is, is much more interesting than, than the caricature. This guy, Tom Honig, not coincidentally, was the longest serving member of the Fed's most policy committee, most important policy committee back in 2010, the, the Federal Open Markets Committee or the FOMC. Honig had been at the Fed for 32 years. He'd been on the FOMC since 1991. And this guy had firsthand experience of seeing what happens when the Fed keeps money too easy for too long. And for most of his career, Honig never dissented. He cast maybe two no votes. He was very much inside the mainstream. But it was really in 2010 when Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Fed, decides to change course and engage in these really radical experiments of holding the interest rate at 0% for several years, which had never happened before, while pumping money into the banking system through quantitative easing, it was these series of really radical experiments that Tom Honig voted no against consecutively. Every meeting in 2010, this guy votes no. And he was trying to stop what he saw as a dangerous experiment. And, and he was also trying to send a message to the public to say that this wasn't like some kind of unanimous decision. There was a dispute going on inside the Fed. And, and the dispute was actually much much more heated and, and a much larger dispute than people understood at the time. Honig wasn't alone. There were, there were a lot of people voting with him. And I just found that by telling this guy's story, I could, you know, first of all, reveal the, the intense disputes going on inside the Fed, and then also kind of explain to people the history of what the Fed has been doing, certainly since the 1970s forward. Yeah, and I found it super interesting because when, when we think of the Fed, we think of, you know, and you mentioned in the book, a group of ex exceptionally intellectual people, and there's sort of the right and the wrong, you know, there's almost always consensus in the decisions they make. But you mentioned how, you know, it, it's very political, and that's that's not always the case, even though the votes might be 12-0. I don't know if you want to explain that more. It, it's really important, you know, I, I think... There's a whole chapter in the book called Fed Speak that kind of gets into this. And I think it's really one of the great legacies of the Alan Greenspan era. You know, Greenspan created this aura of mystique around himself and the Fed. And, and if Fed Speak is this idea that when Greenspan would get up and testify about what the Fed was doing to Congress, he intentionally spoke in vocabulary that was impossible to understand. He, he, he carefully avoided ever speaking in English. And the idea there was to kind of present the, the officials at the Federal Reserve as being these hyper brilliant PhD economists kind of operating at this Olympian level and not really making policy decisions so much as just solving math equations, right? And, and, and that's what the Fed is doing is this very clinical uh, decision-making process with a right and wrong answer that's too complicated for normal citizens to understand. And in, in fact, that's not true at all. I mean, that's just not true at all. And when you really look at the history, you see what, what the leaders of the Fed are doing is that they're making policy decisions about how to manage money. And these are, these are policy decisions that create winners and create losers. And, and that's to me what was so interesting about this guy, Thomas Honig, and his argument. You know, when he dissented 
again and again and again against these policies. He was saying that what we're going to do here, folks, if we engage in these experiments is we're going to allocate money toward the richest of the rich, toward the biggest of the big banks, and, and we're going to push the financial system toward taking increasingly risky bets and, and creating massive, not just asset bubbles, but debt bubbles. And, and in this way, Honig was proven exactly right by history. I mean, this is exactly what's happened and we, and we can get into it, but what quantitative easing and 0% interest rates did overall big picture was they created this force in financial markets that's called a reach for yield. And, and what we're saying here is we're pushing all the big money on Wall Street, the private equity firms, the hedge funds, the pension funds, the insurance companies, we're pushing them to reach for yield out there in the markets because they can't get any yield from saving money or investing it safely in treasuries because the Fed through these programs has brought those yields down. So it's pushing money out into riskier and riskier investments. So, so to back up to your original question, this is what we're talking about. It's not like the Fed was just measuring uh, data on a dashboard and saying, okay, here's where unemployment rate is now. Let's, let's bring interest rates to this rate. The Fed was really engaged in an experiment and in an effort to drive economic growth overall, which is really something the Fed was not created to do. And, you know, the results of the last decade have shown that it was, you know, in, in my conclusion, really misguided policy. Yeah, definitely. And I guess we can, you know, there were so many good points there, but I guess we can go back to sort of why the Fed was created. So it was created in 1913. Um, you know, we mentioned how, you know, they really were focused on inflation throughout the 70s um, and 80s with Volcker. But sort of why were they created? And then how did QE just radically change that that meaning for it? Yes, th uh, thanks. Like, okay, you hear all the time about the Fed dual mandate, right? Yeah. And this didn't make it into the the book, but I, I, you know, my sincere conclusion is that this idea of the dual mandate from Congress, which is a law that says the Fed needs to simultaneously control inflation of prices, control price inflation, and push us toward, quote, full employment, which is an ambiguous number. No one knows what it is, but it's like the best employment rate we can get to. That idea of the dual mandate is nonsense, okay? And the reason I say that is these two things are intention. Sometimes to control price inflation, you need to do things that create more unemployment. And sometimes to boost employment, you need to raise inflation. And the Fed has shown time again, almost immediately, like after this so-called dual mandate was passed in the late 70s, the Fed president, Paul Volcker, hiked interest rates to tank inflation, um, but that raised unemployment. And Congress said, hey, you've got this dual mandate. He said, well, you know, the dual mandate's a thing you got to measure over time. We're bringing down the unemployment rate over the long term by hiking interest rates. So like that mandate is a sliding scale and doesn't make sense. But there's an actual real dual mandate of why we created the Fed in 1913. And it was really important. The Central Bank of the United States, which is the Federal Reserve, was created to do two things. The first is to create and manage a national currency, that thing we call the U.S. dollar is actually a Federal Reserve note. And this is important, you know, before the Fed, there were literally thousands of currencies in the United States. It was a, a wild kind of unmanageable system. It created tons of economic volatility, um, banking panic after banking panic, we could walk through that, but it was an unworkable system. And the US had been kind of resistant to creating a central bank, but by 1913, we just decided we had to do it. And so we created the Fed, to give birth to the Federal Reserve note dollar and to manage that currency. And then the second part of the mandate of what the Fed was supposed to do was to be the lender of last resort. So in case of a banking panic, the Fed was supposed to step in, print new money, create dollars and lend it to otherwise healthy banks to stop panics. You know, because we all know when a bank panic happens, people go in and rush in to get their money and they can kill otherwise healthy banks. So the Fed was put in the center of the banking system to stop that, to be the firefighter. And for many, many decades, you know, the Fed did that job exceptionally well. Between 1913 and uh, the 1990s, more or less, the Fed did a great job. The, you know, I talk in the book about the inflation of the 1970s. 
which really was very largely the Federal Reserve's fault. And, and that comes from studies the Fed itself has done looking back. We, and we can talk about that. But what happens in 08, 09 really is a, a, a breaking point or, or a major historical change in that in the shadow of the crisis of 08, 09, you know, our, our democratic institutions that could stoke economic growth like Congress and the White House these democratic institutions were really dysfunctional and paralyzed. Uh, it's not a coincidence that this book starts in November 2010 when the Tea Party sweeps into power in D.C. And essentially all action in Congress shuts down. And, and as a nation, we kind of relied on the Fed to step in and create economic growth through printing money. And that's a very different thing from being the lender of last resort. That's saying we're gonna be the first resort of, of growth at the Fed, and we're gonna to try to stoke growth through printing money. And, and, and the track record is just incredibly disappointing. What you see from a policy of hyper easy money is that it created huge upswings in asset markets, You know, huge upswings in the price for stocks, for corporate leveraged loans, for commercial backed mortgages, uh, commercial real estate mortgages rather, these things explode. So you see breaking records in the stock market, but overall growth is weak, productivity growth is weak, wages stagnate, you know, the middle class continues to spin its wheels and fall behind. And, and so we've really had a decade of hollow growth that the Fed contributed to mightily through these programs. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, you know, we, we can talk about that later, but then you mentioned there in the 1970s. And I think in the book, you mentioned how they try to bring in price controls and they had very low uh, interest rates to what, compared to the times just to try and get to that point of full unemployment, uh, full employment, which I never really reached. And, you know, all these things failed. So I don't know, you know, maybe you can talk about the, how, why they thought that failed. And, you know, are you seeing any similarities to today? Cause I feel like we've, you know, it's quite similar personally. Oh, my God, it's completely similar. I mean, just take out the name Richard Nixon and install Joe Biden, uh, take out Jay Powell and put in Arthur Burns or Ben Bernanke. And you've got a very, very similar story. And it's really interesting. The great inflation of the 70s is obviously a fascinating and super interesting period in our economic history that I don't think is is written about enough. I mean, we all know about the long lines at gas stations and, you know, at grocery stores, they were having to change the price tag on meat literally during the day because prices were rising so quickly. I, I read two really formative things that, that informed how I think of that. The first is this very long um, series of books. Where am I? Right there on the shelf by Mr. Alan Meltzer, who's this kind of amazing economist at the University of Chicago who went back and did this deep dive history of the Fed for a century, basically. And he really went into the 1960s and 70s and wrote about what the Fed was doing. And, and you see a key mistake that was um, also captured and written about by the Federal Reserve's own studies in, in recent decades by a, a guy whose name escapes me. It's in the book. But what both of these people found was that during the 60s, the Fed was feeling a lot of pressure to keep the supply of money cheap, to keep interest rates relatively low when compared to inflation, to fight um, you know, rising unemployment. And, and what happened during the late 60s was this very, very interesting dynamic where you'd start to see inflation rise and the Fed would raise rates to fight inflation, but then uh, employment growth would slow. So the Fed would cut rates again. Uh, the Fed later called this monetary policy neglect. And, and what it meant was that money was kept too easy for too long. All right. The Fed did not fight inflation early enough. And then the situation really explodes in the 70s. And it, it's interesting. Interest rates at that time were pretty high, 6 7% in some cases, uh, even as high as 10%. But when compared to inflation, that real interest rate was negative. So money was still incredibly cheap. And this stoked inflation in prices. And critically, it stoked inflation in asset markets, which I keep talking about. If there's one point I could make. There are two kinds of important inflation. One is in prices of bread, milk, gasoline, but the other is in these asset markets. And we saw both during the 1970s 
and 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 what's interesting to me in parallel to today is that when price inflation was so hot, the government tried to do everything it could to, to tamp it down without asking the Fed to hike rates. You know, Nixon tried price controls, wage controls, quotas. None of it worked. None of it worked. And it led us to a really terrible moment in the late 70s when the Fed chairman, Paul Volcker, had to double interest rates from 10 to 20 percent, creating a calamitous economic crash uh, in the early 80s, but finally stopping inflation. And quickly, what's so interesting to me about the last decade is that we never saw price inflation. The Fed was printing money at an unprecedented scale, but it never really created significant price inflation. And I'll tell you who is absolutely stupefied by that and doesn't understand why it happened is the Federal Reserve itself. You can see the Fed again and again predicting that inflation will rise, and it never does. I think there's a lot of evidence that it probably had to do with creating the global supply chain in the 90s and 2000s, really kept prices low. But the key point is that because inflation never rose, the Fed felt confident and comfortable in continuing to make money easier and easier and easier by keeping interest rates at zero, by pumping money into Wall Street. And, and eventually, price inflation has now reared its head. And, and so the Fed is in a real bind of trying to figure out what to do. And so, yes, I see a lot of parallels with the 70s in the sense you've got the White House scrambling around to figure out mechanisms to hold down prices. I just read an article in the New York Times today that a lot of economists are talking about bringing back price controls. And um, I mean, heck, I don't know, maybe it'll work, but the lesson, it, it sure didn't work in the 60s and 70s. Uh, what had to happen was the tightening of money supply. And again, please, I'm not like, nobody ought to love the process of monetary tightening in a way. I'm not like saying this is a good thing because we're going to see a lot of negative side effects, but it's hard to see another way out of this inflation short of tightening the money supply. Yeah. And I think there's so many good points there. And one of my last interviews was talking about the impact price has on the instability around the world. And he was saying just how, you know, you look at the, the massive commodity price increase in the uh, at late 2000s early 2010s that impacted you know the arab springs all these massive uh you know instabilities all throughout the world because the price of these essential commodities went up and i guess you know you could say the same thing if that were to happen today that could sort of bring out about it a take two of that it, it exactly and you know you think about what it'll look like we're seeing uh rampant price inflation of course in turkey right now um and um in in other nations and it's absolutely punishing and destabilizing uh, for the lowest income people and for the lower middle class uh, who are trying to you know, make a living through a paycheck. And I, I think it's pretty much widely acknowledged, right? That we just can't let price inflation spin out of control. It would be destabilizing. And one of the points I keep trying to drive home again and again in this book is you know, as a business journalist, I have a great deal, a great deal of concern about the middle class in America. It's kind of a cliche everybody talks about all the time. But to me, it's probably the biggest story going on right now, which is the yawning gap between the very richest of the rich and everybody else. And our middle class right now, or, or just let's just say wage earners, are not in a great position to handle more, you know, economic volatility and downturn. Uh, it's been a decade, well, it's been more than one decade of very, very stagnant wage growth in America. So this makes the threat of price inflation even more concerning. And and yeah. Yeah, sorry. And you mentioned there was a story throughout the book, I think his name was John Feltner, about his story and how, you know, in the past, he had a, you know, he was doing well, early 2000s, had a very well-paying job. And a lot of these people who had that well-paying job now, they're you know, earning almost half of what they were earning 20 years ago. So you're saying that that's really impacting you know, their, their livelihood, obviously, their, their family, and then that's having an impact on so many people around the US, I've seen in the UK and Australia, you know, all throughout the Western world, basically. That's right. And, and that guy's story in the middle of the book, the factory worker you just mentioned, John Feltner, is really important to me because that's, that's in the middle part of the book where I'm really talking about the last decade. 2010 to 2020. And the story of this guy, John, 
reflects where the real economy collides with the hyper-financialized economy that the Fed's created through these programs that the Wall Street types, as you know, call ZERP, Zero Interest Rate Policy, ZERP, which is 0% interest rates combined with quantitative easing. And what you see in this case of John Feltner, he, he works at this manufacturing company in Milwaukee called Rexnord. And, you know, he's your typical machinist. He belongs to a union, makes a pretty good living. And kind of what struck me about John is, is he's an optimistic, hardworking guy who's sort of up for the program today in America. He's willing to be laid off, retrained and get a new job. You know, it's not like he's stuck in the past. But what you see is under this financial system created by the Fed, inside this company, Rexnord, you know, what really pays is not what's happening on the factory floor where John works as a machinist. What really pays is buying and selling financial products like Rexnord's junk debt. And, you know, I actually profile the guy at Credit Suisse Bank who's doing these enormous debt issuances for Rexnord where they're selling, you know, billions of dollars in junk rated debt out in the markets because of this search for yield I talked about. There's like a bottomless appetite for these risk assets. And then you've got the management team at Rex Nord using hyper cheap borrowing to borrow money, do share buybacks, uh, another financial maneuver that's hit record levels here in the US. They do share buybacks using, you know, basically giving that borrowed money directly to the shareholders, loading up the company with further debt, and then, you know, they turn around and do what you have to do when you've taken on so much cheap debt. They start to cut jobs, shift production to cheaper regions, in this case, from Milwaukee to Mexico. Uh, John Feltner is laid off when his uh, factory in Indianapolis is closed. And, and to me, it's a very stark example of who wins and who loses in this zero interest rate world. Yeah, and I think, you know, you mentioned in the in the book that, you know, ben Benanke, who was the he was really the uh, the Fed chair who brought a lot of these, you know, QE into power. And I think he wrote a book called The Courage to Act, which I find quite, quite ironic. But, you know, he, he, he's, and I guess for him, it was the only thing they could really do. That's all, that's, you know, they could pump money in. The Fed doesn't really have many options in that regard. And they thought that there would just be this amazing thing. There'd be trickled down economy, you know, going to, to all the workers, but it really hasn't gone like that. It's been basically the complete, complete, complete opposite is stayed in these financial tools on the top, you know, the CEOs and all the higher ups have benefited, but all the workers have really seen none of it. That's right. And, you know, when uh, Ben Bernanke is key to this whole story, he was chairman of the Fed during the collapse of 08, which by the way, he predicted would not happen. He famously said in 07 that the housing market crisis would be contained. Uh, that wasn't accurate. And then after the financial crisis, he was sort of the author of these experiments. Um, he's the godfather of quantitative easing without question. And when I started this book, I thought, you know, geez, I wouldn't want to be sitting in, in Ben Bernanke's chair. Being the Fed chairman, what a tr huge responsibility. Um, I, I couldn't imagine. And I had a great deal of sympathy for the need to have the so-called courage to act that he talks about. But my view really did change on this as I went back and read the internal debates inside the Fed, inside the top policy committee, the FOMC. It, it's really fascinating. The, the debates are transcribed, but they're only made public after a five-year delay, and they're made public all at once. So they're very rarely ever written about because, like, you know, over a thousand pages will dump publicly and you've got to dig through it for an article. But when you really take the time to go back and, and read through all of this, you see that, first of all, I got to tell you, the Fed did not know what the ultimate impact of this stuff was going to be. Bernanke would go out publicly in August of 2012 and really say that these tools were working. And then in privately inside the FOMC meeting in September 2012, he says, well, if we do another round of quantitative easing, it's going to be a shot in the proverbial dark. You know, we don't know what's holding the economy back. We don't know how if this is going to work, but we've got to do something. But against that kind of notion of like, well, let's take a shot in the dark, you had very specific data and arguments saying, hey, we are only going to be pumping up asset prices, encouraging financial chicanery like stock buybacks, mergers and acquisitions, leveraged loans. We're just going to be encouraging this kind of behavior. 
we're going to be building up massive asset bubbles that are going to be difficult to contain when they explode. And, and we're also going to get very weak benefits in the short term in terms of like creating actual jobs. But Bernanke pushed ahead with this program anyway to be seen as doing something. You know, he would say again and again, there's a risk to not doing anything. We need to do something. And, and his, his memoir entitled A Courage to Act, I think really captures the, the spirit of Bernankeism, which is, the, you know, you've got to do something. And I'd like to point out that a lot of those arguments against these programs were made by none other than Jay Powell, who's currently chairman of the Fed. I mean, he came in saying, we are going to create a financial market crash through all of this. And and he was proven right in this great historical irony that crash unfolded in March of 2020 when COVID hit and the Fed had to respond by quintupling down on this easy money program. And, And, you know, I said the Fed printed 300 years worth of money between 08 and 14. Well, the Fed printed 300 more years worth of money in a few months in 2020 to to stop the crash that Powell himself had predicted. So, you know, these programs really have become a a quagmire that's that's become very difficult to get out of. Yeah, definitely. And I guess you could link it, you know, not only would they bring QE, uh, a lot of these, you know, big banks and asset providers have seen that they bailed out these massive banks during 2008. There was obviously the Greenspan put, uh, you know, earlier so that was another issue as well not only were they going to uh you know pump up the risk due to all this money in circulation they'd also been precedents before that you know if you failed and if you lost or you know you, you get bailed out anyway such an important part of the story i mean the greenspan put turned into the bernanke put to the yellen put to the powell put so now it's just the fed put and the, the idea there of course is that the fed will guarantee asset prices and that changes everything. If you're as an investor thinking, you know, I can go out on this ledge and, and do this because I know at the end of the day, the Fed's going to step in and create a floor. It really changes behavior. And, you know, we, we have to point out that the Fed hasn't just reinforced that the put is there, but it's expanded the footprint. Um, in, in 2020, the Fed literally bought corporate junk debt for the first time ever in its history. And bought loans to small and mid-sized businesses through the Main Street Lending Program, which didn't end up really taking off that program. But, but it, it's, it's turning into the, the, like the broker of last resort for, for almost any financial product. It, it, it's pretty amazing. And you know when you bring up the big banks getting bailed out, it's such an interesting story. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to me, our guy, Tom Honig, who's in the beginning of the book as a Fed critic, ends up retiring after they pass QE, but then he comes back to Washington, D.C. when he's appointed to be vice chairman of the FDIC, which is one of the key banking regulators in the U.S. And this guy who is you know, a conservative and frankly kind of derided by the high-end Wall Street set as being like a hyper-conservative, he comes into Washington, D.C. with this plan to actually break up the big banks. That plan was called the Honig Rule. And what he was saying is we need to go back to the sort of financially stable time under the New Deal in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, all the way up until the 90s, whereby we kind of separate the banks that have a safety net, the commercial banks with checking account for for working people, the, the commercial banks. We need to separate them from the highly speculative kinds of activities we see on Wall Street that are that are stoked by the Fed's 0% interest rate policy. We had such a separation before, the famous Glass-Steagall Act, which got repealed by Bill Clinton uh, with predictable effects that were ruinous in, in 2008. But what's interesting to me is that when, when Honig came in and tried to propose this sort of real structural reforms to banks, he was once again absolutely ignored and marginalized. And it's simply inescapable that these banks that were too big to fail in 08 are now even larger and less able to fail. And, and these banks, you know, the JP Morgans, the Citigroups, the Wells Fargo's have really been dragging their heels to um, work with the FDIC and doing the so-called stress tests or these tests that'll show that the banks are viable. But in March of 2020, when things started really hitting the fan, these banks 
were on the phone Monday morning to get uh, emergency bailout loans from the Fed. I mean, it was like that. So they know that the Fed put is in place and, and that they can count on it. And I think to me, the bigger question for the rest of us is, is this the kind of banking system that's healthy for the economy overall? Yeah, definitely. And you, you say it there, it just sort of increases that divide between you know the middle class and, and the upper class, which is really, you know, it's stark over the past 10, 15 years. It's stark and, and it's socially destabilizing. Um, if you were a Martian and just writing about a democratic capitalist society on earth, and I think what you would say is, as the gap grows dramatically between a very small group of people who capture the gains of economic growth and, and everybody else, and you've got this middle class that's falling further and further behind, and the lower class is falling further behind, and then also at the same time feeling embittered and frustrated as if, gosh, the system is not working for us. And it's a cliche, but it's rigged for a very small group of powerful people, whereby when there's a banking collapse, the stock markets and corporate debt markets get bailed out in a flash. And in, in, the, in the crash of 2020, we actually did see for the first time money go toward uh, smaller businesses in the middle class. But as you know, I, I document in the book just how creaky and rickety and leaky the system is to get money to smaller businesses and individuals. It, it didn't work nearly as lightning fast or effectively as the system for the Fed. But what I was saying is that if you're a Martian talking about this, I think what you would predict is that when income inequality continues at this pace to, to increase, you're going to see social tension. Uh, you know, social uh, outpourings of social dysfunction, whether it's uh, looting or, you know, I don't know, maybe even individuals uh, massing in Washington, D.C. and having zero faith in the system. All of these things, to my mind, are symptoms uh, of a country where income inequality is reaching a level that is creating social instability. Yeah, definitely. I guess you can, you know, you can say it's Oh, I guess it's hard to say it's rigged, but you know, you mentioned another case in 2019 when there was an issue in the repo market, which is obviously overnight borrowing, and how you know the the interest that people had to pay was just grew. I think went from one percent to nine percent almost, you know, over a few days, and a lot of that was due to hedge funds, very you know, highly leveraged, very risky trades, and they got bailed out as well by the Fed. So it's amazing to think that you know all these that they're basically just trying to prevent. I don't know, I guess contagion because all these, you know, so many people are doing it. What's your, why do you think that happened? Well, the Fed is trapped. They are absolutely yeah. trapped. And first of all, thank you for reading the book. I, oh, love, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I love getting questions from, from someone who's read the book. It's, it's really awesome. And, and that episode you just brought up to me uh, is very revealing and important. Uh, this bailout in 2019, because uh, in, in, in between 2016 and 2019, the Fed realized that we have to, quote, normalize. In, in other words, we've got to tighten the money supply because the Fed knew it was stoking these asset bubbles. It was creating financial weakness, instability, and also like not giving themselves any room to move in the case of a future downturn. I mean, there, when interest rates are zero and you're pumping money, like what else is there to do? So the Fed was trying to normalize. And, and they're trying to do that by hiking interest rates slowly, and then by withdrawing some of that cash they'd injected into the banking system through quantitative easing. The rubber really meets the road in September 2019, when the Fed had been drawing that cash out of Wall Street. And I explained it in the book, but they're, what they're doing is drawing down these excess reserves in the banking system. And they reach this point in September 2019 when the system short circuits and the banking reserves get so low that the, the banks become unwilling to extend hyper cheap loans in this very important overnight loan market called the repo market. Again, it sounds kind of complicated, but the headline is there was in fact, absolutely without question in early September, 2019, a panic in financial markets. The cost of an overnight repo loan jumped to 10% uh, overnight from, from about 2.5%. That's the kind of price you saw during the Lehman Brothers crash, preceding the Lehman Brothers crash. I mean, this is like a, a bank panic moment, but there was no 
external reason to describe it. Uh, you know, the, the subprime mortgages weren't going belly up as they were with Lehman. But it was a fact that the Wall Street system had become accustomed to 0% interest rates and money pumping into the banking system at all times. And, and when that started to go away, they started to reprice very, very, very quickly. And so the Fed had to step in and, and stop the panic in the repo market. And ultimately, the only way they could do that was with a new $400 billion round of quantitative easing pumped directly into the banking system. I call it the $400 billion bailout nobody ever heard about. And, and the reason it didn't get much attention is that the Fed described it in these hyperclinical terms about, you know, uh, restoring reserve levels through large-scale asset purchases to draw down overnight yields, like not English, doesn't make sense. Really, what they had to do was pump this money into the banking system to stop the panic. But as you pointed out, this wasn't just like a neutral thing that was just a matter of plumbing. One of the reasons repo rates jumped so high is that these hedge funds had stepped in and taken these massively leveraged bets that were all based around the idea that money's going to stay uh, super easy, unchangeably, right? They, they were, it was a huge bet on that Fed put. And those hedge funds got dramatically squeezed when it turned out that the repo market prices rose. So when the Fed floods the system with $400 billion, they're bailing out these hedge funds that can then get out of their repo trade. But it's never talked about in that way that, oh, we're bailing out this group of very, very lucrative, highly indebted, risky hedge funds uh, it, it's presented as this technical matter of, of plumbing. And, and it's just another example, I think, of how trapped the Fed is in this system of money printing. Yeah, definitely. And as you said there, it's almost that, you know, they're looking for that yield and they just, as you, you know, they know that they're potentially get bailed out, which is ridiculous. But, you know, you mentioned Fed speak and we've mentioned it a few times now. And obviously, it was, I think, you know, maybe Alan Greenspan, that's really when it started, you mentioned why do they do that? Do you think they try and just hide their true meaning because they fear investors will take it too much into account? Or I'm not sure if you have a, maybe a theory on why it happens. So it's a great question. Okay, first of all, there's one driving force behind the Fed's decision-making body. We've, we've talked about this committee, the Federal Open Markets Committee or FOMC. It's run by the chairman of the Fed. They make the most consequential decisions at the Fed. And it's just become hyper important that that body presents a unified front to the world. And they, they justify that as saying, well, the, the markets need to have faith that the Fed will follow through on its word. And if we initiate a policy where there's, you know, three out of, of 12 votes against it or four people voting against it, Wall Street won't have faith in what we're doing and, and, and traders will think we're going to pull back. So that's kind of one concrete strategy. But then to me, the other part seems much more human and less strategic, which is that if you were making very consequential decisions, I think you would prefer that everybody thought you were a super powered Olympian being who is brilliant and can't be questioned. And to me, that's kind of the seductive power of what Greenspan was doing you know, you go back and watch this testimony, this fascinating, go back and watch the testimony Greenspan was doing. He is intentionally obfuscating what he says. He's intentionally being completely inscrutable. And then you read the transcripts of what he's saying inside the FOMC meetings, and he's actually speaking English and being clear and, and saying kind of remarkable things of like, you know, uh, if, if we do if we do another interest rate hikes, it's going to stoke up this dot com bubble, which could be bad, but let's do it. I mean, pretty, pretty clear in, in what he's saying. So I think it's the self-reinforcing mechanism, a, a self-reinforcing mechanism that shields the Fed from hard questions and scrutiny. And listen, I don't want to pretend like this is kindergarten stuff. I mean, the the repo bailout you talked about. Um, I, I worked with a close friend of mine named Alex Holt, and you know it took us a good solid two months of conversation. And I would do a lot of interviews. Alex would dig up a lot of uh, 
uh, academic papers. We'd meet at a restaurant and chart graphs. It took a while to get the concepts. But once you get the concepts, this stuff isn't string theory or, or astrophysics. It's, it's, it's like mechanical. It's like understanding an HVAC system in a building. And it doesn't need to be as wildly complicated as the Fed presents it. And I sincerely believe as, as a reporter who's come into this space to try to write about it from the public interest, the Fed uses this to push the referees off the field and to just say, hey, this is way too complicated for you to understand, uh, particularly you average citizen. There's no way you could understand what we're doing. And if you criticize us, it's because you're not sophisticated enough. And, and, and I got to add, there's a great scene in the book where a Fed president from the Dallas Regional Bank named Richard Fisher is in one of these FOMC meetings. And he tells Bernanke point blank, look, R F Richard Fisher says, I just interviewed the chief financial officer of Texas Instruments, and he says our policies aren't going to create a single job. All he's doing with this cheap debt is borrowing money to do stock buybacks. And if we do another round of QE, he's just going to do more stock buybacks. And Bernanke's answer to that criticism was, please stop bringing up anecdotes from people who don't have PhDs because they don't understand what we're doing. Uh, so uh, to me, that's a very stark example of why they use Fed speak. It's to keep the referees off the field. Yeah, and I know myself, I'm just studying finance at the moment and there's so much jargon and it's so unnecessary. But as you said, it's trying to you know overcomplicate and I guess maybe make it so there's a higher barrier to entry which is which is quite sad and as you said there they're just trying to you know control i guess, I guess the message and you know it's like oh you know don't worry about it we'll deal with it we know what we're doing but at the end of the day you know that they, they might not and and i guess i'd feel better about it if there wasn't and i hate to say this but if there wasn't such a long record of misleading statements from fed chairman um you know, I can just come up with a few off the top of my head when Ben Bernanke goes on 60 Minutes in, in 2010 and says, we're not printing money. I mean, OK, technically, they don't run the printing presses, but he was absolutely obscuring the radical nature of quantitative easing. It's a, a misleading statement. As I mentioned earlier, in 2012, uh, Bernanke gets up in, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming and gives this speech basically saying what we've done is helping the economy and it's stable and the critics have been wrong and we're probably gonna do more quantitative easing. And then in a meeting inside the Fed a few weeks later, he's saying, we don't understand what's holding the economy back, how these tools are gonna to work and it'll be a proverbial shot in the dark. Uh, Jay Powell himself has been a absolutely vehement critic of quantitative easing inside the Fed. Uh, months later, he goes and gives a speech at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., in which he says the critics are wrong. QE works. There's no question about it. Inside the Fed, he criticizes it again. Uh, you know, Jay Powell got up in December of 2020 uh, with COVID. All my time is coming, uh, you know, melting together. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 2020. He gets up and says, we're not seeing... Uh, inflation in asset markets. And, and I just almost fell out of my chair. I mean, the, the Dow Jones had risen like 40% in a matter of months. It was a crazy thing to say. So, it, it, you know, in this way, it, 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 there, there are real stakes to this issue. And I think that there's a real lack of candor uh, and, and honesty in talking to the public about the consequences of what the Fed is doing and their level of confidence behind their own studies, their own forecasts. Um, so that's why this is so important. Yeah, and I think that the meeting notes from uh, 2020 will be very interesting, I think, when, when they get released yes. in five years. Um, but yeah, it, uh, that's what I think. You know, we, We've heard this whole thing about transitory inflation over the past year, and it really seems like they're try just trying to put up a, a facade. It's like, oh, you know, if we admit that we're worried about it, then people are going to freak out. So we're just going to deny it for as long as we possibly can. Which ironically further undermines confidence. And, you know, again, uh, let's let's talk about the, the spring of, of 2021 of, of this year. I mean, nobody knew where inflation was going. The, the global economy had never gone through an orchestrated shutdown and restart 
uh, also in the midst of kind of trade tensions between China and the U.S. that Trump uh, left behind and Biden uh, took over. There were a lot of people saying inflation is not transitory. And then you had Jay Powell clearly saying tr uh, inflation is transitory. Neither one really knew uh, because everything was so new. But it's, it's that projection of utter confidence uh, from the Fed that I think is, is misleading. And I'll, I'll tell you who has gotten it wrong on inflation for a decade is the Federal Reserve. And I don't know if you remember from that chapter about the round of quantitative easing or QE3 in 2012, I found this internal Fed forecast that was given to the entire FOMC as they were going to vote on this program. And the forecast was catastrophically wrong on every major point, uh, including inflation. They just assumed inflation was going to go back to the normal level of 2%. And that just really never happened. And, uh, you know, I interviewed the author of that study, Seth Carpenter, and he admitted, you know, we were just working on these assumptions that were wrong, that that things would eventually return to the mean or, or go back to normal. So there's a lot of uncertainty inside the Fed, which kind of undermines this projection of, of total certainty uh, that they do have in public. Yeah. And you could say that's uh, for many sort of institutions around the world, I guess, the people, you know, there's this thing of, you know, they all know what's happening, but at the end of the day, they're not really telling the truth. But um, I guess we can move on to uh, Jerome Powell, who's obviously, uh, you know, he's quite a big figure at the moment, big figure in the book. And I found it really interesting how, you know, when you start talking about him, he, he's sort of agreeing with Honig, where he's disagreeing with QE, he's disagreeing with what they're doing. He came from Carla, which is a sort of... Um, uh you know uh pri was it um an, an investment company private but, equity yeah private total. equity yeah. yeah but they basically you know made a lot of money from that and he basically knew what was happening as you said he knew that they're you know all these big companies are just going to use it for their own benefit rather than the workers benefit so you know why has it changed why has his opinion changed you just think that he understood that they have to you know he doesn't have a choice as you said before or do you have any other opinions I do. And, and to me, the, the most important thing we really need to get down is without a fact, his his view changed. And that's really important. Uh, he first of all, you know, that company I mentioned earlier, Rexnord, where John Feltner worked, where we had the debt and the buybacks. Jay Powell, to a large degree, was directly responsible for that. It was kind of amazing when he was a senior partner at Carlisle Group. Carlisle bought Rexnord. Under Jay Powell's leadership, he was actually on the board of directors at Rexnord, loaded that company down with debt, and then sold it for a $900 million profit. And after he sold that firm, it was loaded down, really crippled by the debt that uh, Carlisle Group had loaded onto it, and then Carlisle's successor, Apollo Group. So, you know, he was directly involved in, in a lot of these systems that were benefited by QE. What's so interesting is when Powell gets nominated to the Fed board in 2012, he comes in directly from that world of private equity. And his remarks are stark. He's saying, we have got to pump the brakes on the money printing. We are building up long-term unknowable risks. And he's saying, I'm seeing stuff in the leveraged loan market and the private equity market that is highly worrisome. These, these, these valuations are way inflated and they're going to correct. They're you know, if we could just pump up asset bubbles forever, life would be so easy. But the problem is, is that the price eventually converges with the value, you know, and, and then the markets uh, render their verdict. Powell saw that that was going to happen. And he said it's going to create a, quote, large and dynamic event, you know, which is a polite way of saying a, a crash. And, and he was one of the major forces of, of three Fed governors who tried to get Bernanke to pump the brakes on quantitative easing. They really, they, this group that Powell worked with inside the Fed that you know I document, they, they were pretty successful in trying to kind of at least trim the wings of quantitative easing. But what's so interesting is in 2015, as Powell is kind of gaining stature within the Fed, he's working at the Board of Governors at the Fed's headquarters in DC, he really changes his tune. And, and the kind of real public demarcation point was that speech I mentioned at Catholic University when he gets up and says, you know, the critics are way off base. Uh, none of these problems with QE have manifested yet, which is fascinating because he was the very one inside the Fed saying, you know, this stuff happens over a long-term 
period of time. Like we're talking about um, changes in the market that could take years to express themselves. So why did he pivot? Why did he come to embrace quantitative easing? Why did he stop criticizing it as vehemently internally? Uh, Powell says he's seen uh, the studies that the evidence is in, and it shows that quantitative e easing was a success. But, you know, Powell's very close colleague on the FOMC, Richard Fisher, the president of the Dallas Fed, told me on the record, there were no studies that changed the fundamental landscape of any of this stuff in 2015 when Powell pivoted. Like, there was no new evidence that changed the system. What did change was that, that Powell was rising up within the system. And as Fisher, as Fisher put it to me, when you're in that environment, it's a very cloistered, close environment of the Fed governors. And I mean, another Fed governor, Betsy Duke, told me on the record how Ben Bernanke, the chairman, would talk individually with each uh, governor and work out deals so that they all agreed how to vote with one another before the meetings even happened. And, you know, within that kind of environment, Powell came to embrace these easy money policies. And, and, and at this point, it kind of doesn't even matter what he thinks about it or what he says. The, the, the legacy of what the Fed did in the 2010s is, is shaping everything the Fed does now. Uh, there's just no escaping it. So they are in a very tight position of trying to figure out how can we possibly tighten the money supply to fight inflation without creating a financial market crash? Yeah, definitely. I guess you could say that dissenters probably don't progress through the ranks either. <laughs> yeah, like yes. That. Yes, as the book shows, yes. And we saw that with Honig and yeah, and you said Fisher and all these other people who are dissenting there, you know, Janet Yellen, who is a massive supporter of Bernanke, Fed Chair Powell, who, you know, changed his mind, Fed Chair as well. So I guess that's what we're seeing. And look who, look, there's one path you can take of agreeing to pump more money into Wall Street to quantitative easing, keeping interest rates at zero. You are going down that path. You are not going to antagonize Carlyle Group, Blackstone, JP Morgan, and Wells Fargo because they know that they can ride the bubbles on the way up and then get bailed out on the way down. And, and they do not fight those kinds of measures. So there's a very clear road of low resistance to take that path. When you take another path and you argue, as Thomas Honig did, for breaking up the big banks, for having a more restrained monetary program that doesn't stoke hyperspeculation on Wall Street, uh, you can see what happens to voices like that. I mean, you are facing headwinds at every turn. And I don't think it's coincidence that Honig has been painted with such a negative brush over the years. Yeah, definitely. Well, I interviewed someone, um, uh, Ian Fraser, about the 2008 financial crisis and uh, about RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, which was the largest bank in 2008. And I think they had $2 trillion um, assets under management. And you compare that to BlackRock now that has $10 trillion. <laughs> You know, it's five times larger. It's scary to think that, you know, these, are, these banks are five times larger than they were back then. So, you know, we'll, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I it's, it's just don't really want to think about it, do you? <laughs> No, it's not great to think about. The government um, is hostage to these private institutions. And, you know, what jumps into my mind is just the irony of this, which is that, you know, the Fed was created in 1913 in response to a similar situation. When, when there was a banking panic in 07, 1907, they relied on the actual J.P. Morgan guy to step in and bail out the financial system. And there, there was like tremendous resistance to that publicly. This idea that the small group of people on Wall Street had so much power, they wanted to create a government central bank that was at least you know, tangentially accountable to the voters, even though it's insulated from voters. And, and here we are today with these massive institutions and, and this clear set of decision-making has happened that these entities cannot be let to fail, no matter what the price might be uh, to the taxpayer or in terms of the Fed going out on a limb of monetary stability and, and pumping however much money is needed to bail out the Black Rocks, the JP Morgans, the Goldman Sachs, the world. 
it it's uh, it's a daunting, sobering, even frightening kind of situation to think about. Yeah, definitely. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining the podcast, talking with me. And I guess you, you know you mentioned a really good point there. Uh, but do you want to leave maybe a message with our audience uh, about the interview, or maybe about the book that you want them to really take away from it? Um, no, thank you so much for reading the book. I really appreciate it. And I guess I'd say my guiding vision when I wrote this was to try to create a very quick and easy read that could give people a lot of really useful information about how the Fed works and how it's changed the world. If there's one thing I want to do as a reporter, it's to help everybody have a nice, clear, sharp understanding of where we are and why we're here and how things work. So, um, yeah, that's my hope for it. Yeah. And I think it, it works really well in terms of it, you know, it gave a short, you know, history of the fed. It just, I think provides everything you need. And, you know, you mentioned a book, a book in there that I think it's the complete history of the fed, which is thousands of word, uh, thousands yeah. of pages long. So I think this is a lot more manageable, uh, way, way to learn about the fed, but also, you know, the actions I've done recently. Yeah. Yeah, it's my job to read through that stuff so you don't have to. Yeah, definitely. Well, I've got a, a, I put on my reading list, unfortunately for me, but I'm sure it'll be pretty interesting. So Chris, uh, and if anyone wanted to buy the book, where I know there's Amazon, anywhere else? Anywhere. Uh, it's Googleable, Easy, Lords of Easy Money. It's available at all booksellers. So Perfect. yeah. And if they, if they wanted to see your uh, other work, where would that be? Uh, it's at Christopher Leonard, one word, Christopher Leonard biz. You can see my past books and articles and some articles around the fed. So it's all there. Yeah. Perfect. I'll put that all in the description below, but yeah, Chris, thanks again for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon. So you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.